Well, hey, as you guys are taking your seat, I just want to say thank you again for joining us here at Highland. We know some of you may be new, and so I just want to say a couple of things. One, not only are we thrilled that you are here, we've got an incredible team of people that are excited to meet you. So after service, if you would go through those center doors and make a left and head to group life, we'd love to get you connected. And if you already are connected, consider going to see Pastor Darren over at Go Central. He and his team would love to find a way to help you get uh, the ability to serve here at Highland. And speaking of serving, Christmas is right around the corner. And um, this year, Christmas time is going to look a little bit different. We've been working behind the scenes to come up with some creative and impactful ways to make an impact here in our community of Casper during Christmas. And in the past, we've used things like a production. And rather than doing a one-time event, we want to be intentional about blanketing our city with the love of Jesus throughout the entire month of December. And in the coming weeks, we'll be sharing more about what some of those opportunities might look like. Um, but this is an amazing opportunity to spend the entire month of December loving our community. And uh, all of this is going to culminate in a Christmas Eve celebration together. We'll come here together, we'll sing the songs on Christmas Eve, and we'll celebrate the birth of Christ. And so now that we've covered Christmas, we have a number of other things we're going to cover. So let's turn our attention now to these next steps. Welcome. I'm Darren Adwell Palker, the Go Pastor here at Highland Park. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today, and I'd like to encourage you to take your next steps here at Highland. Your very next step should be towards getting connected to a community group here at Highland Park. If you're new here or you're not yet connected to a group, head out the center doors and take a left after the service and connect with Group Life today. Our team would love to visit with you, and we have a gift that we'd like to give you. If you're part of our online community, we want to connect with you as well. Please text our team at 307-288-9157. We'd love the opportunity to get to know you and help you find your place here at Highland Park. As the Go Pastor, I love to see people discover how their God-given gifts can be used to bless and impact others. Here at Highland, we have opportunities to serve both inside and outside the church, in our community, and around the world. Another way that you can serve is by packing a box for Operation Christmas Child. Today is our last Sunday collecting boxes. If you still haven't got to bring yours back, please bring it to the church no later than this Wednesday so we can get those out to children around the world. When you pack a box, you're providing a child an opportunity to hear the gospel and get connected to a church that will then help them grow in their journey with Jesus. We want to know what's going on in your life and how we can support you in prayer. On Tuesdays, our staff gathers together and we pray over every request we receive. Visit our website or hop over to our app and fill out a prayer and connection card or fill out the card in the seat in front of you and drop it in the box as you exit the worship center today. There's another way that we need your help to help us care for you better. Due to some recent changes at Wyoming Medical Center, our hospital visitation team is no longer notified when people from Highland Park are in the hospital. So please let us know of friends and family who are in the hospital. You know, at HPCC, we take risks to pursue God and love like Jesus. And one of the ways we do this is by sharing Jesus with others through Jesus Conversations. Jesus Conversations happen when the Holy Spirit opens the door for us to pray with, to care for, or share Jesus with someone in your life. Our vision is that everyone in Casper hears that Jesus loves them and has the opportunity to respond to his love. That will only happen if we each do our part to step through the door as God opens it. Each time you have a Jesus conversation, represent it by adding a sticker to the wall in the atrium and then tell us about it on our app or our website. Every Jesus conversation is truly a win that we can celebrate together. Worship is our response to God's gift of life to us in Christ. As we continue in worship, I want to encourage you to offer God your tithes and offerings. You can give on our app or our website, and you can drop your tithes in one of the boxes as you exit the worship center today. 
When we give, we recognize that everything we have comes as a gift from God, and giving is our way of honoring God with what we have and letting our resources be a blessing to others. Keep up with all that's happening here at Highland Park by visiting our website at hpcc.church and sign up for our weekly newsletter so that you don't miss out on anything. And now, join us for week four of our sermon series, Affections of the Heart. Hey, good morning. So good to see you guys today. Hey, I heard this awesome story this week. And uh, when I heard this story this week, if you're joining us online, I wanted to say a welcome to you. And if you're going to worship with us later this week, sorry, I almost forgot that. I want to say welcome to you. Hey, so I heard this awesome story this week, and it so filled my heart. I just didn't want the story to end. And I know some of you might be thinking, that what I'm talking about is how the Detroit Lions beat the Green Bay Packers last week. I mean, it's like, it's like a story of miracles. I, was, I almost wore my jersey today. I just didn't want to be a distraction today. But that's not the miracle I'm talking about. I, I literally did hear a miraculous story this week that was so amazing. I, I didn't want it to end, and I wanted to start this morning by sharing this story with you. It happened up in Cody. I was talking with Arlie. And he was telling me just this movement of God in, uh, in this woman's life. She uh, was a drunk driver and uh, knocked out a transformer in town. And between her sentencing and the time that she was incarcerated for, uh, for her drunk driving, she found her way over to Highland Park Community Church in Cody, Wyoming. And they do this thing called the table. It's where they just step into the Lord's Supper. And that night... It, at church, she was there, and she discovered Jesus' love for her. And she knew all the awful things that she'd ever been a part of. But that night, Jesus Christ reminded her of who she was and how much he loves her. And she found forgiveness in the name of Jesus that night and gave her life to Christ and said, I'm going to give my life to letting the world know of how Christ has made a difference in my life and how his love has transformed me. Well, she had to, she's currently incarcerated for like the next eight days. So we're going to stop and pray for her in a minute. But her only prayer was, Lord, use my life the rest of my days to make your love known to the world. That's, that's what I want my life to do. Her sole focus when she wakes up is, Lord, use my life to let people know of the power of your love and how your blood cleansed me from all, all unrighteousness and how your resurrection means I can have life and I'm a new person. And so she goes into jail and the church sends her a Bible. You got to have a special Bible, I guess. The, the jail only allows a special kind of Bible inside the prison. So the church sent her a special kind of Bible and she starts reading it in her cell with two other ladies. Well, one, le- one woman was moved, and there was only one other woman left in there with her, and the woman said, would you please read that out loud? So her name is Jessica, who is in jail. She begins to read God's word out loud, and the woman in the cell with her says, I have no earthly idea what that means. Can you explain that to me? Jessica tells her story. Jessica describes and tells her what God's word means. And in that cell, another woman said, knew all of the ugly things she had ever done. All of them. She knew what a wretched person she was. And she discovered that God loved her so much that he would send his son Jesus to bear our sins. And she found forgiveness in that jail cell. And she found life in that jail cell and gave her life to Jesus Christ. Amazing. But that's not the half of it. So after that happens, the prison guards show up and they say, in all of our time here, we can't remember something like this happening. 
But the lock on your cell will not lock. It is impossible for this door to keep you in here. You can't stay. We have to move you to another holding area. We have to actually move you into a cell that will lock. There were 12 other women in that cell that would lock. When they get into that cell, the woman who just gave her life to Jesus says, I want to introduce you to my friend Jessica. Jessica has been reading her Bible and explaining to, it, explaining to me what it means. She's been explaining to me who Jesus Christ is and how Jesus has set me free. And she gives her story. And the woman says, would it be okay with you for the next eight, ten days if Jessica just continued to read the Bible out loud? To which the women responded, yes, please. Only God can work in ways like that. And we're all Jessicas. We're all that lady. All those women who are incarcerated by our own sin from within. And Jesus would come to set us free. I believe that you have a story that empowered by the Holy Spirit when you tell it has got the power to transform a life like what is happening in there. But right now, I'm going to ask all of us, wherever we're at, to pray for the Jessicas. In, whether their names are in Lusk, whether they're up in Cody, could we just stop and pray for the word of God in the name of Jesus to go forth and that he would use Pray for one another, but we're just going to, for 30 seconds to 60 seconds, let's just pray for Jessica and the other Jessicas, and let's pray for ourselves, that we would just be bold and courageous, okay? Let's go. One, two, three, go. I'll wrap us up here in a second. Lord, all across the land, I pray the name of Jesus would be lifted up. Not just on a day called Sunday, but on every day that ends in Y. From places, from jails, from places of restaurants, from offices to homes to neighborhoods. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. May captives be set free. May blinders fall from eyes. May hearts of stone be replaced with hearts of flesh. May people call on the name of Jesus and find the freedom that you purchased for us so long ago. May the name of Jesus be praised and worshipped around our world in every language, in every tongue. In your name we pray. Amen. Today I believe Jesus is going to set some people free in this service today because of some of the things we're going to talk about. We've been talking about the affections of the heart. I had a chance to meet some new friends this week. I got to go out to coffee with them and during the time of our conversation they said man what's your favorite verse that's an easy one for me my favorite verse is Ephesians 2 10 it says for we are God's masterpiece created new in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God planned for us long ago what I love about that passage is it tells me who I am it tells me God has made me to be his masterpiece not just some average Joe, not just somebody average, but a once of a lifetime, once generation type person that we're God's masterpiece. We are his creation. And it tells me who he is, that he is the architect of that, that he is the greatest artist. He is our creator and we are his masterpiece. He's talking about the church. He says that God's plan is to make us anew in Christ Jesus to make us new, to give us a new heart. We've been talking an awful lot about that, to take this sinful heart, this old heart, and he place his heart and his spirit in us. And that our greatest purpose is found in living out the plans that God has for us, plans for us to share Christ. That's my favorite passage, Ephesians 2.10. 
Well, 30 years after Paul wrote that letter to the church in Ephesus, just 30 years after that, John, disciple of Jesus, record, records the words of Jesus to the same church in Ephesus. But this time, the messaging is very different. Are they still his masterpiece? Yes. Is Christ still want to give new hearts? Yes. But listen to the messaging in Revelation to the church in Ephesus. Jesus says, I see your deeds. I know your good works, church. I know that you don't like evil. I know that you do not approve of false teachers. But he says, I'm going to hold this against you, church. You've forgotten your first you forgot your first love. That was 30 years after Paul's letter to Ephesus. Just 30 years. They had forgotten their first love. Did they look like a church? Yep, they looked like a church. Did they gather like a church? Yep, they gathered like a church. Did they do things that churches do? Yep, they did things that churches do. But Jesus, looking at the heart of the people, looking at the minds of the people, says, you have gone adrift. There is some affection of your heart, whether given to idolatry, whether given to something else other than me. Church, you have forgotten your first love. And that was just 30 years. We're over 2,000 years later. Over 2,000. Is it possible, if not probable, that there are some misguided affections inside of our heart inside of our minds where jesus would say hey i look at you i see what you got going on there i love your good deeds i love how you go and you serve others man i love that you don't want wickedness i love all that but you've forgotten your first love you got some misguided affection that is pulling you and leading you astray these misguided affections we're calling affections that oppose the direct will of God for our lives. And his will is that we would love him with all of our heart, right? And for the Hebrew people, they didn't have a word for mind. Their, the word was love, and it meant their heart. And it meant to love God with the whole person, to love him with their intellect, to love him with their affections, to love him with their actions, to love God with our whole self. And that's what we've been talking about. Well, today... I just want to talk about some misguided affections for a minute. There are times in our lives where we just don't deal with the misguided affections. And when those misguided affections have a place in our lives, they can develop what the scripture calls strongholds. A stronghold is a fortified position. And I firmly believe because I've done this in my own life, and misguided affection, whether it's around sexual immorality, whether it's around greed, whether it's around pride, whether it's around anger, whether it's around bitterness, you just kind of drag it around like baggage, and sometimes it bothers you, sometimes it impedes you, and sometimes it doesn't. And if we don't deal with these strongholds, they be, or so we don't deal with these misguided affections, what they do is they become strongholds. Things that take us captive. Things that hold us captive. Did Jesus come that we would live in captivity? He came to set us free. I want us to know, Jesus wants us to know that he came that we could live in freedom. And I would dare say there may be some people today that are walking around thinking, man, I've just got this thing. I'm going to try harder over sexual immorality today. I'm going to try harder over greed. And you're trying everything in your strength. I'm going to try harder over my anger. I'm going to try to be a nice person today because Jesus wants me to be a nice person. I'm going to try not to tell a lie. I'm going to try not to gossip. I'm going to try this, that, and the other. And you're trying but it's this misguided affection, and it's spiritual in nature. That's the thing, is oftentimes these things that impede us, these misguided affections, we don't see them for what they are. The spiritual attack on our lives, they can be spiritual in nature that want to hold us captive. 
And when we just let them go, they can become what the scripture calls strongholds. Fortified positions. Now, you think about a stronghold. When I think about a stronghold, the first one that came to my mind was Normandy. World War II. Happened on June what? D-Day, June 6, 1944. There was 50 miles of beach that were held by the Germans. And the United States, along with Canada and Britain, Britain said, no, we're going we're gonna to take over that stronghold. 50,000 Germans had dug in to that beachhead. They had created fortified positions. To them, it was absolutely impenetrable. That's what a stronghold is, impenetrable. It's just fortified positions. And so the idea was, we can't meet 50,000 Germans with 50,000 other troops. We have to overwhelm them. And so the plan was made between these three countries, these allies, we're going to send in 115,000 troops on June 6, 1944. 115,000 troops. We're going to send in over 6,000 tanks and over 2,000 aircraft. And we are going to overwhelm this stronghold and we're going to take it back. Now on June 6, by God's goodness, that happened. There was a lot of shedding of blood. But that stronghold was broken. Well, the Bible speaks an awful lot about sinful strongholds in our lives. And if you would, please turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because Jesus, has, God has given us his son Jesus. He's given us a new heart. He's given us his spirit. But where we're going to see is that Jesus has given us even more than that to demolish misguided affections, turn strongholds in our lives. And he wants to set us free. Let's read this together. Paul's talking to the church in Corinth. And he says, though we walk in the flesh, though we walk in the body, we are not going to wage war against our misguided affections the way that the world wars against them for the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh and what are weapons that people use of the flesh lying bitterness anger power force paul's saying we're not going to use any of that we don't need to use any of that we got to have something that's going to overwhelm these strongholds he says we've been given what we have divine power we have divine power. God has given us his power to destroy what? Strongholds. I want us to look at three words there. The first word I want us to look at is warfare. There is a war being waged for our soul, misguided affections. And that when they're left to stay there, will wreak havoc on us, will separate these misguided affections, unaddressed, Meaning, not delivered over into the hands of Jesus. Man, they'll lead to death. They'll lead to suffering here. There's a warfare, a spiritual warfare taking place. I want us to see that word divine power. Oh, man, God has given us divine power. We're going to talk about that divine power today. And I want us to see strongholds. These misguided affections becoming strongholds. But that word stronghold is not just any fortified position. The word that Paul uses here is a Greek word that I'll say, but I'll probably butcher it. And the truth is, it is very important, this word. The word is akaroma. But what it means is not like a Normandy, not like a fortified position. What it means is it means there's a prison. That's what he means. God has given us, there are some a war being waged against us that wants to hold us captive in our minds, captive in our hearts. He wants to hold us there, wants to imprison us there. And that's what Paul is talking about with these strongholds. My sense today is there's probably some strongholds in this room represented in hearts and minds and lives 
where you're being held captive against your will, where you're fighting for all you're worth and maybe you're tired and maybe you're worn out. And Jesus wants to set us free and he has given us divine power to overcome these things. Now what are some of these strongholds maybe that have taken root in your heart, in your mind? I love how Rick Renner describes these strongholds and I want to share this with you. He says, a stronghold, a prison, is a lie that the devil has ingrained so deeply in our minds and our beliefs that they now exert power over us. We need an overwhelming power to destroy those strongholds. What are some of those strongholds? You're going to see this happen more and more and more because it's all over our TV. Gambling. Gambling is a stronghold, and it is going to take deeper and deeper roots in our country. You see it all over our TV. Now, for those of you guys who love to gamble a few bucks and you got a few extra bucks to kind of get rid of, okay. i not saying it's okay. I'm just saying it exists. Vegas doesn't build buildings like that because they lose. They build it because you lose. And they do it with your money. They are never, ever going to advertise in front of you a family whose home is being taken from them because they can no longer make the payments. They will never show you kids crying because their mom and dad are fighting over what has taken place because gambling has become a stronghold and is ruining their life. But gambling, this risking of money, is becoming a real stronghold in our culture, even within the Christian community. Trying to get out of debt, make a quick buck, that can be a stronghold. If you're gambling, you say, I'll never do it again, only you keep doing it again. And right now, maybe the pain isn't that bad, but if you continue on this trajectory, it could become really bad. The Holy Spirit would say to you, hey, this is a stronghold we need to take care of today. Not only for your own soul, but for the soul of your family. Other strongholds that exist, even within the church. Pornography, a click of a button. They say it is more addictive than the most addictive drug. And it's not just men, it's women too. You click this button. What they don't show you behind that click is they never show you, they never advertise to us how pornography will ruin intimacy with your spouse. You're like, doesn't matter, I don't have a spouse. They'll never show you how pornography will ruin intimacy, oneness, a connectedness with your spouse, with your future spouse. They'll never show you that. They'll never show you, ever, families being destroyed over pornography. Is gambling a stronghold in your life? Is pornography a stronghold in your life. Maybe it's not pornography, man. Maybe it's just going out to the strip club. There's a reason those places exist. They're strongholds in a community that take strongholds in our lives and exert their power on where we can't stop. Does that stronghold exist in your life? The need to be broken. What about a stronghold of worry? Where you've got this worry, maybe you've got this fear, and fear and worry have a stronghold in your life. Or maybe it's a stronghold of thinking that you're worthless. You're so debilitated. You walk around so defeated. 
think you're nothing, worth nothing. Oh, man, we're going to get to talk about how Jesus came because he thinks your life was worth dying for. Oh, Jesus, speak to people's hearts. Do you have a stronghold of being just walking around defeated? Or maybe bitterness. Is bitterness taking root in your heart? You've got a stronghold of bitterness. Maybe it's jealousy. You're just jealous all the time. Always comparing. Is there a stronghold that the Spirit is bringing to mind in your heart? Jesus came to set us free. And God has given us his son. He's given us a new heart. He's placed a spirit inside us. And he's given us divine power to overcome these strongholds in our lives so that we can have an undivided heart. And we got to stop looking at misguided affection. Like they're just all these little things that we carry around. You got to start looking at these misguided affections as a stronghold. You got to look at them the way that we as a country looked at the Germans on that beach. Like these things are wicked. These things are evil. They represent a presence of evil in our life. You got to eradicate it and can't do it on my own. So what are these awesome demonstrations of divine power that God has given us to demolish these strongholds in our lives. His word, for starters. This is a mighty weapon against strongholds. So what, listen to what uh, Paul wrote to Timothy about his word. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. What is righteousness? It is being in right relationship with God. It is about living in a right way that honors God. His word right here is powerful in training of righteousness so that every Man, woman, child, every servant of God may be how equipped? Thoroughly equipped, completely equipped, wholly equipped for every good work. When I came here nine years ago, I was the most insecure person you have ever met in your life. Behind a big personality, was this fear. And it wasn't until I got in here and got every verse I could possibly find on fear. Every verse, everything Jesus ever said. It wasn't until I got in here and let the Spirit speak through this that not me wielding it, but by exposing a lie that the enemy had convinced me of that led to fear, this truth began to demolish strongholds in our lives, in my life. Man, if money, if greed is a stronghold, do you know what this is? Jesus says, a person's life does not exist of the abundance of things. If lust is a stronghold, in your life. You know what Jesus says? You know what God's word says? Flee. Flee from all kinds of sexual immorality. Run from it. It doesn't have to master you. He's given us power over. If bitterness, anger, rage, whatever it is, there's a word for it. Love what John says here in John 8, 32. You will know the what? The truth, the enemy tries to get this stronghold by convincing us of these lies. But God's word is powerful. It's a divine weapon to demolish strongholds. You got to know what that stronghold is. You got to know the truth. And the spirit of God that lives inside of us will begin to demolish that 
stronghold. One of the greatest lies of our modern day is the enemy is attacking the weapon that God has given to save us. I just read this staggering fact that inside the church as a whole, across North America, something around 40 plus percent of people do not believe that this is the inspired word of God. They don't believe it's true. What a powerful lie the enemy would want to convince us of. Because if he can hold you captive with a lie, and he can lie to you about this, he can neutralize the weapon. But I want to go back to that, that passage in Timothy that all scripture, what does it say? All scripture is inspired. It is God-breathed where the Holy Spirit led men, real men, to write this. But it was the Spirit who authored this book through the lives of men that we might believe the truth of God and he would demolish strongholds. Another weapon that God has given us is prayer. James 5.16. The prayer of a righteous person is what? Powerful and effective. The prayer of a life that is submitted to the authority of God and to the love of God is living in right relationship with God and with others. That is powerful. Prayer is powerful. And you know what you hear over and over in today's church? I don't know how to pray. Jesus tells us how to pray. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Imagine praying through the Lord's Prayer over these strongholds that exist in your lives, in your kids' lives, in your grandkids' lives. How would things change in your life if prayer wasn't something you did when you woke up or when you did before a meal, but it was a way of life? How would prayer change if you, if, how would your lives change and how would those strongholds change if you just confessed on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis, Lord God, hallowed be your name. Because you are power, you are love, you are life. Man, how would your life change if you lived in that authority? And to pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What would it look like for you to pray the will of God over your husband, over your wife, over your future spouse, over your kids, over your grandkids? How would God change the reality there? Oh, it's powerful to demolish strongholds. You see, I see some righteous people before me, but what some righteous people before me need to start doing and me before you, more righteous people need to start bending their knees and taking advantage of this divine weapon that God has given us to demolish strongholds. Every Friday, I gather with a group of people, and Lord God, may it be so. That beyond just that Friday group, there are other groups interceding on behalf of the church, interceding on behalf of marriages, interceding on behalf of people captivated by strongholds. What would it look like if we as a church gathered in Jesus' name at our lunch breaks and we did Bible studies and when we went on walks with our girlfriends, we prayed for our kids and over strongholds and interceded for our husbands. Man, husbands, what would it look like to grab other God-fearing men and intercede in Jesus' name for our families? There would be this shaking, this demolishing of strongholds in Jesus' name. It's a powerful weapon. But so many of us treat it like it's something we got to do before we go to bed or before we eat a meal. Great place to start. Great place to start. But don't stop. Fasting. Oh, what a weapon fasting is. But we're a bunch of foodies. Fasting is the foregoing of food for the pursuit of God. And you can fast to demolish strongholds in conjunction with God's word and prayer. In Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, there was this evil spirit that the disciples could not cast out. And Jesus says, it is only through fasting that you can demolish these type of strongholds. Fasting, the foregoing of food, pursuing God and bringing these strongholds before him can demolish 
Have you ever fasted, given up food? Have you ever taken that, that thing, that misguided affection and said, Lord, I'm going to bring this to, before you, before it comes to stronghold in my life. I'm going to fast over this because I want to experience your victory. He's given us divine power over those strongholds. We get to fast. And it's not us who changes. It's the Spirit of God that does the hard work. The act of sanctification, making us more holy. Your faith. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness? Do you believe that he placed a new heart in you and that you can experience his love now and forevermore? You see, that type of victory, that faith, that Jesus is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do, which is set us free from the power of sin which is to lead us in everlasting ways of life, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Oh, come on. You want to talk about destroying strongholds. These aren't just simple weapons. These are overwhelming weapons that make the enemy flee. And let's not forget the armor that God has given us from head to toe, that in this battle, we're not some innocent victims. It's been set free. These are the divine powers, the divine weapons that God has given us to demolish these strongholds. This church, by God's grace, church before me, leaders before me, thought, you know what, it'd be really good to have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery to help people and their hurts and their habits and hang-ups. That God might set people free. My sense is, is that there's a hurt, habit, and hang-up. Maybe you'd say, oh, I'm not one of those people. No, you're one of those people. I'm one of those people. And if you're saying that, that's pride talking. Is pride your stronghold? Go get help. We've got a healing place. We're counselors. Professional licensed counselors. They're world class. They're here to help set us free. In Jesus' name. We've got a staff of pastors, myself, who want to be set free, who want you to be set free. And so this morning, I'm going to invite Greg and whoever Greg invited to come up. He's given us group. But we want to pray for you. And I know it would take courage to get out of your seat. If there's any stronghold that exists, we want to pray for you in Jesus' name. It's just the first step. But ask you to be courageous and say, I got a stronghold that I can't beat by myself. And Lord, I need your divine power to set me free. I'm going to ask all of you to stand with me. Make it easy so you don't have to step over people. Just slide by people. And we want to just pray for you and anoint you with oil in Jesus' name. So that you can live in the victory that Christ purchased for us. Lord God in heaven, the enemy would love to hold us captive. But today we defiantly stand in opposition of his attacks on our lives. But we don't do so in our strength and our power. We do it in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who came that we might live in freedom. For my brothers and sisters who are living in these strongholds, I pray in Jesus' name today that you set them free. Help us as a church. Walk in the victory so that like Jessica, whether we go wherever we go, our first and forefront thought would be to let the world know of your great redeeming love and what you've done to give us an undivided heart. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Some folks want to be prayed for. If you want to come down, we'd love to pray with you, for you. We just leave in silence and uh, also leave in victory and go tell people God's great redeeming love for them.